So again, my name is David Noy, Vice President of Product Management. Uh, we're going to walk through a couple of things that we do on the software-defined storage side. And storage is a place that I've spent a huge part of my career, decades and decades. Um, you know, the Veritas software-defined storage portfolio spans block, file, and object. And a lot of people don't know that we have file and object. Now, they all know about block. There's a number of people, everyone knows about VXFS and VXVM, especially if you're an old Unix user. If you were a Solaris user, AIX, HPUX, you have no choice at HPUX, actually. Um, there is only VXFS. But, you know, people know the block products, may not be aware that there's a file product. We launched this file product in the <coughs> last year, and I've been watching software-defined storage for a very long time. This product has done more in terms of revenue growth in one year than I've ever seen any software-defined storage product do in the world, ever. Object came out around November, December, actually, of last year. And uh, we're still trying to get our hands around where to position this one versus this one. This is obviously around massive scale. But this has a very clear use case, and I'll walk you through it. So in the block space, InfoScale used to be called Storage Foundation. It's one of the first software-defined storage products. It's really a mature technology. Right? We know this is what keeps Oracle databases and SAP instances and TIBCO and Informatica and all these other type of applications highly available, highly performant, and running well in Unix and Linux environments. The interesting thing about the product is that that product continues to be on a slight growth for new licenses. I'm looking at that product. I stepped away from it back in the you know, mid-2000s. I come back in 2018, and holy cow. Things still selling. Well, it turns out there's still a lot of mission critical applications in the world. And if you look at the top storage uh, controller software products and the top high availability products, there's nobody in the top four that's of one that's also in the top four of the other except Veritas. We're in the top four of both. We're number two or one and number one or two and the other one. And the marriage of the two, the ability to actually move storage along with the application and make sure that it stays highly available online, fast failover, that is a golden proposition that continues to pay off. What's interesting, though, is that we're starting to see people do this actually in the cloud. So we're now starting to see lift and shift, where people are taking their enterprise mission critical applications and using the storage foundation or InfoScale stack, InfoScale Enterprise, which includes the VCS product and the cluster file system product, and actually drop that into a cloud setting and start to move mission critical applications into the cloud. I think that, that was pretty, pretty cool. We've seen it in Azure, we've seen it in AWS. Will you go into a little bit more of the infrastructure later on of how that actually works? Uh, it's, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, you need shared storage, which basically means you need something like an EBS volume that can be mounted by two uh, uh, EC2 instances at the same time. And you run your applications, you run your VCS stack. At that point, basically, you, layer store, you install storage foundation onto the product. And it's no different from having a SAN on the back end. Now, the other thing is that in the, in the InfoScale product as it is today, it can actually work with something called with, with DAS, with write shipping. So we can actually emulate a SAN. It's kind of, it's kind of like a vSAN-like offering, where we just basically do I.O. shipping between nodes so that you don't have to even have a SAN. You can actually just use direct attached uh, LUNs. You've got two EC2 instances mounting one EBS volume. Okay. I didn't think that was possible, but... Does it come up that it's in use by another instance if you try and do that normally? I didn't think it was possible either. But. Um, you can do basically with one EBS into one EC2, right ship to the other one, and they basically mirror across the two. So they, you're doing the mirroring, but they're mounting, we do the mirroring. They're mounting independent EBS volume. That's right. We have that right. capability. Okay. So so similar to same. what I would oh, do. Shared volume. Okay, that, that was confusing. Yeah. yeah. Consider it like a uh, yeah. consider it like a vSAN as a shared nothing co just configuration. So this is so basically um, clustering inside uh, instances. That's right. We mirror. How would I mount that? Was that iSCSI or something? Then uh, we mirror it. Uh, so all data is mirrored. If one of the nodes goes down, the other one basically comes up. It's got a mirror copy of the data. Are you presenting that storage then to another instance that's consuming it, or are those instances mounting the EBS volumes also <coughs> in the app? They're also running the application. So it's basically hyper-converged, if you will, because it's the, the operating system has the stack running, which has the EBS volumes. It's mirrored between those volumes. If the application goes down, comes online on the second node, has a mirrored copy of the data. But in a hyper-converged topology, sorry. Yeah. But, um, the storage 
is provided by the hyperconverged hardware, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee that the application is consuming storage that's running on the local storage that's on that same. Yeah, no, in this case, it's, it's local. The same cluster. In this case, it would be local. It has to be local. What? And if it's not local, it will go to another node. If you have like a four node or eight node cluster, mm -hmm. then it will determine what other node has that data, that data and do an IO ship across the back end network in order to get that IO, in order to get that data. Okay. But if the application lives in a separate server. The application runs on the server itself. And that server has this software inside it. So how? If I had a if I had a whiteboard, I would draw a red hat There's box. There's a whiteboard right there. Ta -da. If I had a whiteboard, <laughs> I would say. Here's one we prepared earlier. You have, in the simplest case, two instances of operating systems. Red Hat may be running here. Red Hat, excuse my writing. Red Hat. Um, you'd have the VXFS CFS stack running here. EBS instance one and two. Data is mirrored between the two. You're good to go. Now, What's if you want to go doing to the mirroring, the mirroring is being done by this stack has a back end interconnect. The, the so software right, itself okay. is yeah, yeah. software itself is doing the mirroring. It's VVR. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, it's not VVR. It's actually just a back end interconnect that knows how to do I/O shipping. Right. It's okay. not using VVR. But if you were to go to four or eight nodes, that might be Stripe in different locations. So this one might have to go to this node in order to get the data. If this node went down in the mirror, it was putting it over here. Okay. So are people bringing their traditional like service guard and those types of applications to do the orchestration of the process moving, application moving? So basically the same thing I'm doing in my data center when I protected SAP using uh, service guard. If, yeah, so uh, if I lost storage, the, if I lost the storage layer, then all of my ECC, ECC instances and everything just got moved over to the node that had the data. In this case, it doesn't have to get moved over because we mirror mm -hmm. between the two. Well, the processes yes. have to get moved over. The processes moved have to get moved effectively over. Effectively, yeah. the, the server's down. The processes will be started or restarted mm -hmm. on the other node. That's right. Okay. Yep, that's right. In the traditional HA manner. But that's the interesting thing that we're seeing about this kind of people taking what is a mature technology for enterprise applications and moving into a cloud context. So I'm not familiar with your on-prem version of this, but that would be the same on-prem as what you're doing. Would be the same on-prem, except on-prem you have the option of using a, a SAN on the back end. Yeah. And if you have a SAN on the back end, you don't have to do any of this like IO shipping. Okay. Because that this is the uh, this IO shipping all assumes DAS, direct attached. Because you've got no bus to move that. Across. That's right. Okay. Yeah. You still have a bus because. We have a file system, it does a global lock manager, and so there's sending data back and forth between the nodes all the time anyway. If, if you were doing this for conventional virtualization, you'd have a, a, a shared virtual bus through the SCSI adapters and a quorum disk and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But okay. you can't do that because you can't get down to that level because of it's in the cloud, so they're doing it at software level. Makes sense. So I yeah. want to go on to the next one because I think the next one is, for me, a little bit more exciting. When we take the InfoScale product, which provides a clustered file system, again, each of the nodes now can see the same file system either because of I.O. shipping or they're on the SAN, preferably I.O. shipping because DAS brings your costs down significantly. Now, if we take that uh, shared file system and instead of running the applications directly on those Red Hat instances, we put a protocol layers on top. We now build a cluster NAS and this becomes a scale out NAS. Uh, and there's a lot of different use cases you can use a scale-out NAS for, but the one that we are seeing the most uh, adoption around is building a long-term retention disk target. So just think of basically as I'm dumping data out of net backup, where do I want to go put it? Well, I can put it on a couple different places. I can put it on tape. I can put it in a purpose-built backup array. I can put it like, or NAS. I can put it in NAS. I can put it in object store. I can put it in the cloud. We know that there's a big market here, and so we basically built a scale-out NAS appliance. We'll go into more detail on this appliance, but this basically is available in a software form factor as well as an appliance form factor, and we've seen just massive adoption. This one has just seen massive growth. In fact, before the product even went GA, we had already sold several units to people, customers who were looking for this kind of a solution at two and a half petabytes of just disk target for their backups, as opposed to tape. So help uh, help us out here because you guys are relatively late to the market with this type yep. of solution. Yeah. I can get that from uh, 
a dozen people. What, uh -huh. what, what's unique about Veritas' solution that it was pent up demand? Well, the pent up for? demand is this. I was one of those dozen people. Okay, I ran a product line that did about many millions of dollars of backup target, right? So my team is also a team who came from that particular product line at a three letter company, okay? Um, we knew that customers like to have a single solution from a single vendor, one phone call, one support experience, and an optimized experience. When you buy this product as a backup product, I can give you a performance level that's better than the competition in terms of streaming input, so ingest. I can give you a solution which is at a price point per terabyte that's as good or better, in fact, better than the competition. By the way, I can integrate with net backup, so things like data doesn't have to rehydrate and then to send it across the wire, hit this thing and then deduplicate again, I can send it in deduplicated format. So I use less network, get it across faster, keep it deduplicated the whole way. I can use that, our products like InfoScale to map what goes when, what has actually gone into this particular product. Um, and from a support experience, again, you're dealing with one vendor. We can help you with the configuration of this through some recent acquisitions around kind of uh, IT orchestration. We can make it very easy to set this up. Simplify it, automate it, you drop the, the, these purpose-built, this uh, long-term retention appliance in, point the net backup server at it, or they figure themselves out, you're done, you're ready to go. So from an operation perspective, <clears throat> from a cost perspective, from a uh, efficiency perspective of keeping data re uh, de uh, deduplicated, not rehydrating it. Um, it's what? got everything that everyone else has and more. Why, why would people choose that over using S3 though, if you back get right of net backup? Great question. It's more expensive. A lot of people, w oh, so S3 is more expensive than this. This, the price point that I'm selling this at is way less than S3 if you just do a three year or even a five year calculation. I think I'm, this is an SDS product, though, in the cloud. This is an SDS product. However, we sell it as an appliance as well. So if you buy the oh, appliance, right. okay. you look at the appliance, you basically look at a monthly cost of owning that appliance. We are less than Glacier. Oh, so we're owning so the appliance. Sorry, I thought we were doing SDS, but we're comparing the cost of an appliance in that scenario. That's right. That's three. Okay. And so the cost of the software is even lower than that, right? But the software is if you want to bring your own hardware. Now the question just becomes, why would you want to put stuff here versus why would you want to, where would you put it in the cloud? This SDS has the ability to tier to cloud. So you can set policies that says after some amount of time or some whatever, tier the data off to cloud. So you might use this as a two and a half or five petabyte buffer for keeping data on-prem. The reason you would use it in the event that you did get hit with ransomware, for example. So you get hit with the WannaCry virus. Now you need to get back online quickly. You have two options. Either you bring it back off of one of these really quickly, or you wait for it to come back across the cloud. That's, that's kind of the options that you have. You said that the, the monthly cost on this is less than S3. Less than S3 for sure. So, but if I'm buying an on-premises appliance, am I buying the appliance, or are you doing some leasing trick to get the, so we pay a monthly OPEX? You buy the appliance. Okay. I don't understand how it can be less than. On the, on the that's not a wide. fully, that's, I mean, I'd love to see those numbers sure. because I have yet to see a, a case where on-prem hardware mm -hmm. plus software fully baked in total TCO mm -hmm. is actually less, unless okay. you're at scale. So we'll save that for another day, but we will build that calculator and we can do the division for you and you can tell us where we're right or wrong. But the numbers that I've shown, this is Glacier pricing or lower. Just to go back to Keith's point, you're asking how this differentiates. A lot of what you talked about was if you're using net backup and that single vendor. If yeah. I'm not using net backup. If you're not using net backup, then you can still use this as an inexpensive, high density backup, uh, uh, purpose built backup appliance, right? It, it's not going to do the dedupe for you. We will add that capability in the future so that you can actually do dedupe as well. So it'll be like a PBBA with dedupe. Think of it like a data domain type solution, if you will. But um, so the real compelling offering here is for existing net backup. For existing that's net backup, why you have that pen up to that's a super compelling. You could, but we've seen customers want to put this behind TSM. It's just a backup solution, a backup uh, target behind TSM as well, which is IBM's product. And maybe they want to put it behind Commvault too. That'd be fine. All of those products have the ability to basically put data into a NAS box. Now, that particular product 
is NAS, so it's NFS, SMB, and S3 on top of InfoScale. Scales to, this will be five petabytes, soon it will be like 16 petabytes, something like that. So quite large. And if you're deduplicated, that's logically even larger than that. <coughs> okay. We also introduced an object store. I think this object store is pretty interesting in that we call it the Veritas Cloud Storage, renamed Cognitive Object Storage. And what's interesting about this is it does everything that you think an object store would do. It has uh, always uh, consistent, eventually consistent to always consistent. It has multi-geo capabilities, as erasure coding capabilities, cross-site erasure coding. Um, but what it does that I think is kind of differentiated is that on ingest, it has the ability to go and classify data so that as an object basically comes into the system, a classifier will go and then basically extract information and metadata tag that object so that you can do more things with it down the road. In fact, you can even trigger workflows based on that classification. So in an industry-specific or vertical-specific application, think of a healthcare application. If this object came in and it basically it's telemetry off of a heart monitor, I might notice that there's an abnormal pattern and I might trigger some kind of an event or workflow to, to basically occur because I'm looking for those patterns. Make sense? In an IoT work environment, that would make sense. There's a number of others that would make sense as well. Is that S3 compatible in terms of the API? Is it an S3 API? It's, I wouldn't call it 100% S3 API compatible, but it's S3 API compatible, yes. It also has MQTT for IoT workloads. Now, if you look at kind of our software-defined strategy stack, we have storage for data protection and disaster recovery, but we're adding these data lake and management orchestration and visualization capabilities so that we can start to look at um, taking these repositories of data and actually extracting metadata from them through classification or through ana analytics, sending that into an ETL pool, and then be able to provide value-added data services, whether they're lineage, audit, um, compliance, you name it. There's a number of ones that we're working through as kind of value-added services that can be added outside the box for anything that you're storing, for, that you're protecting. So if you think about all the data that you're protecting, structured and unstructured, I may want to go and start to ask questions or extract metadata and do metadata-based an analytics on that data. And that's where we want to move up the stack. We're not going to build compute and VMware and container and network virtualization. That's somebody else's problem. But we do want to be able to own the data, manage data, and provide visibility to the data and analytics into the data as well. And whether that occurs on our premise or whether we're sending it into a cloud environment and then doing all of that analytics in the cloud and providing you full visibility to what you have in the cloud depends on the preference of the customer. Note that when we tier data to the cloud, we don't charge you for it. There are many, there are many vendors out there who built NAS. I built one recently that was quite successful. Uh, and we charge customers a per terabyte price to send data to the cloud. We don't do that here at Veritas. We're software defined and we want to embrace the cloud. We don't want to create impediments and barriers to moving data to the cloud. Okay, hold on a second. So, I, I gotta be candid. I'm having sure. a hard time following. I feel like you're jumping around a lot of different, a lot of different things and I'm yeah. having trouble making the connection. Sure. So, question. For example, you say, uh, I'll give you a very specific example. You just said that, okay, we don't charge for, for ingress, you know, data coming into cloud. But what you aren't doing is you're not saying, then how do you charge? How do we charge? We charge... No, but hold on yeah. a sec. Uh -huh. so you see my point. If you're going to say, we're not doing this, say what you are doing. So, so here's what we do. Case of the we data, provide... Piece, yeah. how do you, gotcha. If you're, not, if you're not charging there, how does Let's the be customer clear. get charged? You get charged the following way. You use our net backup product. That's our flagship product, which charges you on a front end terabytes of data being protected, right? Now, whether you store it. Gross. 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 So if I've got 100 terabytes that I'm wanting to protect before dedupe, before any sort of analytics on it, mm -hmm. 100 terabytes, raw. No, that's right. Okay. Now, if you want to take all of that stuff, and by the way, you back it up and you back up all the deltas and you back up all the deltas, that's going to grow quite large. Over time, it could become <coughs> four or five X of what you, your front end, your back end could become huge. But I'm still being charged for... You're still being charged for front end. 100. Okay. okay. Now, we'll also charge you if you want to put an appliance in your own data center. So if you want to run our software, like our net backup software in an appliance, 
You don't want to have to go and get buy your own servers and buy your own storage arrays and JBODs and whatever. We'll build a that backup purpose-built appliance for you, and we'll charge you for that appliance. And oh, by the way, if you want to then dump it into a low-cost, cheap and deep NAS, we'll charge you for the cheap and deep NAS box and for the software for doing that. Mm -hmm. But we're not going to charge you to go stick that data up into the cloud. If you want to tear it off to the cloud, knock yourself out. Meaning... I pay for whatever the cloud charges are. The cloud will charge, the, the CSP will charge you okay. for that. But we're not going to create an extra roadblock in the, let's put it this way. So you, your company, technology will support the ability to do it. Yes. But any sort of cost related That's to that, from the, the CSP. customer has to, has to bear. Depending right. on what CSP you have and depending on what their pricing is. Now, we'll start to build some intelligence into our products to where we can give you like, hey, guess what? If you go to this CSP probably going to cost you this much versus this CSP probably cost you that much. We might be able to give more advice as to where to go put things. And you're still not doing any dedupe along the process of the tiering. We dedupe it. We can send a dedupe directly out of NetBackup into the cloud. At what point? When I hit the appliance or? Right out, of the, right out of the NetBackup product. Okay. Right? So if you're running it on a NetBackup and you have a, uh, there's a product called Cloud Catalyst. Cloud Catalyst will run, it could be running on your own server or on our appliance takes that dedupe data and sends it directly to an S3 target. Okay. So we'll send it deduplicated. But if it's running in the cloud, then it's then I'm sending the data before it gets deduped. No, it gets deduped on-prem. Okay. Through Cloud Catalyst, and then it gets sent directly over S3 API into the cloud. How does Cloud Catalyst compare with Net Backup? Cloud Catalyst is an extension to Net Backup. Okay. It's a feature of. Okay. Okay. So it's a process that essentially goes and takes the deduplicated data and allows you to transmit it over S3 API. Make sense? Follow me now? For now. OK, good. Now, we want to give people options, right? So they can send it to cloud deduped. They can send it to our purpose-built uh, backup long-term retention appliance. They can put it in a backup appliance. It all depends on what they want to do with it. Why would you put it in a backup appliance versus an LTR appliance? Backup appliance would be, hey, I want to go build a backup environment, and I don't want to buy all the servers and, and all of the infrastructure required to go build out a backup environment, including the storage components. So I'm just going to buy a purpose-built backup appliance called the Net Backup Appliance. Net Backup Appliance has evolved quite a bit, so I'll talk about the Flex version of it in a moment. Or I want to be able to then take it and just jump, jump it in a cheap and deep disk array, a NAS. And we have that option too. On option three is, at some point, I want to move that off all into the cloud. I want to keep it deduplicated the whole way, knock yourself out. You never have to rehydrate it until you actually want to go and get it back for use. Okay? This is the cognitive engine. This is what I was talking about, basically, as objects come I'm into the object sorry. store. Yes. I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. again, so where do you hydrate along the process coming back then? If you deduped it yep. going out, where does the hydration come back? Hydration happens when it gets back to BatNet backup. So, so it gets hydrated all the way back? All the way back. Okay. Now, having said that, we will put the dedupe engine into our various appliances, and we may even provide it as a library that you can even run in the cloud at some point, which means that you could rehydrate it for read-only purposes at any point along the way. Does that mean the way that it's architected today, I can't rehydrate it back down? Today. So I can't restore to the cloud if I dedupe? If you dedupe it and you send it to the cloud, mm -hmm. now you just want to do a cloud restore, you could do that if you were running NetBackup in the cloud. But you have to be running NetBackup in the cloud. You have to now. You have to replicate that metadata database that's holding that's right. the dedupe. Dictionary information. Yeah. However, what I'm suggesting is that down the road, being able to run that dedupe engine as a standalone engine for rehydration is something that we're in the process of building. So that basically, if you had that, that, that deduplicated in, uh, data in the cloud, you just crack it open for read purposes. I don't want for read write purposes, obviously, but for read purposes. Unless you wanted to restore it as like a test instance. Then I, then I would read it and I would restore it onto some high performance uh, storage and use it as a test instance. Okay. I don't want to modify the backup data. That's what I'm saying. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we talked about this. 
So why appliances? Is it's basically just ease of use. It's a consumption choice. Customers can choose whether they want to buy appliances or deploy the software themselves. Simple as that. We went through the Access Appliance. This is basically the InfraScale product with two heads uh, running cluster file system and some JBODs. Uh, starting at 600 terabytes, going to 2.5 and soon 5 petabyte of capacity at a price point, as I said, extraordinarily low. Integrates fully into the NetBackup product. No dehydration, rehydration, dehydration. Easy configuration. Ultra dense. Makes a lot of sense. One support call. <clears throat> a lot of, we've actually, in the first month, I'll just put out a petabyte number. First month that this product was out, it did 20 petabytes. So that'll give you an idea of kind of the amount of demand that this product had. <laughs> now, a NetBacko appliance uh, can go and talk to this. This is called the Access Appliance. That's the long-term retention, low-cost long-term retention. But a NetBacko appliance does more than that. It runs the NetBacko processes. All of these can tier to cloud. I'm going to skip ahead because I know we got a lot of things going on, but one of the things we did under the net backup appliance that makes it interesting is in the past you have all these different net backup services, whether they were a copy data management, this ability to your point to basically take a instance of a backup and turn it into a test and dev <laughs> uh, instance that you can start operating against. We had this cloud catalyst thing, which was a, which is a feature of net backup to go and send stuff to the cloud in its dehydrated format. We had all of these different media server, master server. You might have multiple master servers for different domains. And those would all have to run on their own servers. So what we did is we containerized all of those things as applications. Not that different from what people did when they containerized applications and run on your iPhone. And we consolidate those into the new Flex appliance. The Flex appliance is essentially a net backup appliance that runs containerized services on the head. So now all of those different capabilities, which used to run as separate instances and sometimes ran on separate servers, can basically be instantiated, turned on, turned off, all on one containerized platform. What, what's the container platform that they're <laughs> utilizing? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So could, in theory, you deploy those same containers on a container service in one of the clouds and have the same functionality? In theory, we could virtualize this whole thing and. Well, why virtualize it? Just take the containers and run them in a service mesh in one of the cloud uh, container solutions. Yeah, but you, you could. I agree with you. But now your all your master server and media server, everything would be running in the cloud. All of the connectors, all of the data that it would be backing up would be on-prem. It's Is it possible? There's probably some technical way to do it. Well, I mean, if you wanted to utilize this backup technology for services that are running in your cloud environment. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah then, yeah, probably possible to do. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I feel really dumb. Oh. Um, right. I, I'm just, I, I'm just having a hard time, again, following, like, so am I backing up Azure, AWS, or Google to an on-prem device? Is that what That's this, not what is, this is saying? Okay. What this is saying is, this is the new net backup on-prem solution. Yeah. It's an on-prem solution that backs up on-prem applications. Yeah, I got that part. And then basically can tear it off the, the backup data into any, in one of the cloud vendors. So we're not talking about backing up cloud-based data. So if you have a cloud-based infrastructure. If you have cloud-based and you're 100% cloud-based, then you would be running the net backup software in a cloud environment. And now your question is, I think the question that I got was, can I now take that net backup infrastructure software, run it in a fully cloud environment, back up your cloud applications, which I think, yes, the answer is yes. Can you do it in this containerized fashion? I don't, we don't support that yet, but it's not something that we technically couldn't move towards. So help us understand, because uh, uh, what a lot of your competitors do, they point to you, specifically to you guys, yeah. and say that this master server architecture that you guys have had for years yep. isn't cloud native and it's <coughs> legacy and it, it isn't the way to do it. So I love you guys the, had yeah. the opportunity to, to, to redesign that. Yep. Why do you think this is the best architecture to move forward with? So I think this is the best architecture for, t for the legacy environment. This is your legacy on-prem, but it is the most modern way 
that anyone's doing a legacy on-prem backup appliance. The next generation ones that you hear everyone point to and say, oh, we're doing it differently. We're doing snapshot-based backup of an of a Amazon instance, and then we're protecting it on-prem into our own. We have that product coming too, and that'll be later. So we will build that solution. We're building both because there are needs for both mm -hmm. in both environments. The backup administrator is very familiar with this thing. The VMware and the application person and the DevOps and IT person is very familiar with or loves or is enamored with the new solution that you're talking about, which is more of a scale up, a scale out rather, um, snapshot based, easy button based uh, data protection and recovery solution. We're building that too. Okay. And we, 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 we have a large customer base to yeah, moving serve. From, moving from net backup to something else is not easy. That's right. If I'm a, so we, so we want to make it easy, yeah? Yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. If, I, if I'm a net backup customer at the moment, and yeah. I just want to stick things in an S3 bucket, yeah. do I have to buy one of these? You or do not. I, what There's I, a whole new product called CloudPoint. CloudPoint is our next generation data protection product, okay? CloudPoint is basically exactly what you just described. It's the ability to point at your Amazon-based workload, take a snapshot, and that's your data protection. No, as, in, no, as in, that's one use case, and it's an important yeah. use case going forward. But just if I have, I don't want to buy any more on-prem storage for my backup. Okay, oh, you just want to ship this directly I off. I just want to ship it directly yeah. You can, you can do that with the Cloud Catalyst product. Yep. So I've got to buy the, I've got to put that Cloud Catalyst product in. The Cloud Catalyst has, has to be running on a server somewhere and you can just ship it straight off. Is that an appliance or is that? You could put it in an appliance or you could just buy a server and run it, run it on a server. It's up to you. Okay. So if I can do it's that. It's a process. It has to run somewhere. If I can do that with an existing net backup solution and yeah. I had that and I put it to S3 and I presume the others. Yeah. Is the advantage of this now that I can run VMs and ca containers on top of that? And that's, that's right. Mm hmm. So if we, did you have customers asking you saying, I've got this great net backup solution, but what I really want to do is run containers on top of it. We had customers who came to us who said the following things. I want to go and run, I have multiple domains that I protect for, for, for purposes of uh, a multi-tenancy. I don't want to actually mix them up. So I run separate net backup servers. I want to be able to consolidate that down so I don't have 10 head units, right? I have... Um, uh, different rate ver versions of net backup running environment. Maybe I can uh, upgrade some of those versions. Maybe I can't upgrade others. Oh, I want to use this Cloud Catalyst thing the way that you just described as well. And I don't want to buy yet another server <laughs> to go run Cloud Catalyst on. So give me a containerized platform so that I can go put Cloud Catalyst on here with my net backup server, master server, and then basically ship stuff off directly. We can go build that for them with some amount of storage for some amount of on-prem you know, retention, whether it's three days or a week or whatever it is, right? But we can go and build that for them. 